Sure it does. It's charging on. Mr. Speaker, His Excellency, the Governor of the Great State of West Virginia, the Honorable Earl Ray Tomlin. Thank you. Please be seated. Oh, no, wait. <laughs> I forgot. He's supposed to do something first. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my honor and privilege to present to you the governor of the great state of West Virginia, the Honorable Earl Ray Tomlin. Can I be seated now? Okay. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, member of the Board of Public Works, Justices of, of the Supreme Court of Appeals, members of the legislature, distinguished West Virginians, and my fellow West Virginians. Five years ago, when I first addressed this chamber as governor, I called on our state's legislature to get to work and put West Virginia first. And although many things have changed, including the makeup of this legislature, our commitment to the people who call our beautiful state home has remained steadfast. Since 2011, we have created a number of new opportunities for future generations, and we have faced our fair share of challenging times. Tonight, our state is at a crossroads, and I stand before you with a plan that preserves the best of our past while charting a bold new plan for our future. Since 2011, we have welcomed more than 250 companies and $10 billion in major investments, providing hardworking West Virginians with more than 11,000 good-paying jobs. We've worked hard to create a business climate that makes West Virginia a strong competitor for major economic development projects. And we're not just competing, we're seeing huge success. Nationally and internationally, recognized companies like Macy's, Amazon, 
Quad Graphics, and Toyota already know that West Virginia is a great place to do business. And tonight, I'm proud to announce Polymer Additive Company, Adivet, has reaffirmed its commitment to our state and plans to expand. <laughs> After receiving FDA approval for a groundbreaking polymer to be used in food packaging, the company was on the hunt for a new location to expand its production facility. Major players from the Gulf Coast actively pursued Adivet, but our state's development office stepped up and showed company executives that West Virginia is the right place to invest. This new expansion project not only saves nearly 100 current jobs, but it brings in at least $12 million in new investments and additional opportunities for employment. Plastics manufacturing is just one of the downstream industries we're working to attract. And this expansion project is just the beginning of that growth. <laughs> Adivet chose to stay in West Virginia because of our strong business climate and a highly trained, experienced workforce that's ready to get to work. These types of investments don't happen overnight. They're the result of the hard work and positive changes we have made over the years. We have overhauled our workers' compensation, and companies operating here have saved more than $323 million since the program was privatized in 2006. We reformed medical malpractice and improved our legal climate. We have enacted gradual reductions in our business and consumer taxes, and since I took office, we have saved employers and West Virginians more than $225 million. <laughs> this year, we ranked higher than each of our neighboring states in this year's Business Tax Climate Index. And companies are noticing these changes, and they are paying off in big ways in regions across the state. This September, we joined officials from Procter & Gamble to celebrate the groundbreaking of the company's newest manufacturing plant, the first of its kind built in the United States since the 1970s. Projects of this size and scope strengthen our economy, create new jobs, and serve as investment in both our state and our people. This factory, located in the eastern panhandle, will create 1,000 jobs during the initial construction phase. Once fully operational, it is projected to employ the company's fifth largest workforce in the entire country. We have worked hard to bring these jobs to West Virginia for West Virginians, and now they need to be filled. That's why more than a year before production begins, P&G has partnered with Blue Ridge Community and Technical College to create specialized training programs to meet workforce needs. These certificate and degree programs are preparing students for careers in engineering, computer science, and electronics, and training students to become skilled chemical operator technicians. Blue Ridge President Dr. Peter Chekovich and his team are working hard to make sure our students can compete for these good paying jobs. And P&G construction manager Louise Gutierrez is already working with crews on the ground as part of the company's initial construction efforts. He and his family love call, calling West Virginia home. So please join me in thanking Dr. Chekovich for his continued efforts and welcoming Louise and his family to West Virginia. Would you please stand? In 2012, we launched a new workforce training program called Learn and Earn. This program helps students receive classroom instruction and hands-on experience while earning a competitive salary. 
and it gives employers a cost-effective way to recruit and train new employees. We know this program is incredibly successful, and companies like Gestamp, which manufactures auto parts for some of the world's best-known brands, are taking advantage of these training opportunities. Since Gestamp first opened here in 2013, the South Charleston plant has tripled production and more than doubled its total workforce. Today, Gestamp employs more than 700 West Virginians. And these are real jobs, and the company is already seeing a real return on investment. Through a, pro through a partnership with Bridge Valley Community and Technical College, students can get hands-on training and earn a one-year certificate, an associate's degree, and a journeyman's card. Tonight with us is Paul Lizanlik. Le Gestamp's new plant manager. I'm still learning. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, he's here with a plant, uh, he's a new plant manager. And Jamie Thompson, a learn and earn graduate, who is already training 12 new students. So please join me in welcoming Paul to West Virginia and congratulating Amy on his success. Please stay. These partnerships are essential to helping those investing here train the workforce they need to grow. And tonight I'm introducing legislation to expand the Learn and Earn program statewide by redirecting nearly $300,000 of the current budget to create new valuable learning experiences for our students. We know we must do more to improve our state's workforce participation rate. I'm proud that today there are more job training programs in place than ever before. With the help of more than $40 million in federal grant funding, Workforce West Virginia is helping coal miners and their family and those who have exhausted their unemployment benefits find careers in growing industries. These programs help employers train employees their way at their work sites and provide up to $5,000 in tuition assistance for classroom instruction and on-the-job training. As we recognize the, these efforts to train our workforce, I ask that you remember those who call our state's southern coal fields home. As a son of these coal fields, I've dedicated my life and my years of public service to supporting our miners and their families. And despite the difficult times we find ourselves in, West Virginia remains the fourth largest producer of electricity in the country. And I believe our coal industry will continue to support our families well into the future. However, we cannot ignore the unprecedented shift that has taken place in our state and in our nation. Forces beyond our control have severely damaged our coal industry, and even the most optimistic among us realize it is unlikely the coal will ever reach production levels of the past. For generations, our miners unearthed the coal used to produce the low-cost electricity that fueled this country's industrial revolution, one that remains unmatched anywhere in the world. This nation owes these West Virginians a debt of gratitude, and we are ready to cash in on that substantial IOU. <clears throat> This fall, we submitted an application to the National Disaster Resilience Competition, seeking more than $140 million in funding from the United States Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development. This competition has the potential to help six counties in our southern coal fields adjust, adapt, and advance their communities. If we're successful, these federal funds will help us rebuild aging infrastructure promote land use planning and hazard reduction efforts, and stimulate housing and economic development in areas outside of these regions' floodplains. 
We're also proposing to develop the largest industrial site in West Virginia history at the former Hobet surface mine in Boone and Lincoln counties. With 12,000 acres located just off Quarter G, this site is large enough to fit virtually every major economic development project in recent history, including Toyota, Procter & Gamble, Gestamp, Macy's, Amazon, and more, with thousands of acres left over. We know this is a major undertaking, and with the help of local landowners, Marshall University, West Virginia University, and the Virginia Conservation Legacy Fund, we are working together to find new uses for this site while mining activity continues. So please join me in welcoming this outstanding team, interim Marshall University President Gary White, new Marshall President Jerry Gilbert, WVU President E. Gordon G., and Tom Clark and Kim McCoy of the Virginia Conservation Legacy Fund. Let's give this team a round of applause. Tom and his team at VCLF also are helping us develop new and innovative ideas to include, include in the state's Clean Power Plan submission. While the DEP continues to work on a feasibility study, we anticipate our final plan may include ideas such as reforestation and the replacement of boilers to increase power plant efficiency. So Tom, again, thank you for your assistance on both of these very important projects. We appreciate it. This is just the beginning of what we can do to help, the, to, to help diversify the economy, not only of this region, but our entire state. When pursuing large-scale projects, our talented team at the Development Office consistently runs into one major obstacle, a lack of flat land. Redeveloped surface mine lands offer endless opportunities for residential, commercial, and industrial development and in many cases, all three. As part of our federal grant application, we have identified at least five sites in each of these counties, Boone, Lincoln, Logan, Mingo, McDowell, and Wyoming counties, which are all strong candidates for similar redevelopment efforts. Well, much like the country owes West Virginia for our contributions over the years, we as West Virginians owe the people who call this region home the opportunity to do better for themselves and their families. For years, taxes on the coal mine from our southern coal fields and the timber taken from our mountainsides have paid for our children's schools, the roads our residents drive on, and the services on which so many West Virginians rely. It's time we reinvest in these communities and give these families every opportunity to make a good living in the places they have called home for generations. Tonight, I hope you will join me in making that commitment to the betterment of our state and our people. As hardworking West Virginians continue to mine coal that powers our nation and drill for the natural gas that offers new opportunities for growth, we must guarantee these natural resources meet our needs here at home. As the ninth largest producer of natural gas in the country, we must work with those operating here to create the processing and pipeline infrastructure necessary to ensure this industry's continued growth. The ongoing development of the Marcellus and Utica Shale and the Rogersville formation just being explored is already bringing new revenues and new jobs for West Virginians. 
That's one reason I sent a letter to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission in support of the Columbia Gas Mountaineer Express Pipeline Project. This $2 billion investment will transport a significant amount of natural gas to new markets. Much like similar pipeline projects by EQT, Dominion, and Momentum mid midstream, this investment has the potential to create thousands of good paying construction jobs while generating significant tax revenues for counties to fund local schools, roads, and other worthy endeavors. While these announcements grab the headlines, we can't forget our state's small business owners who work day in and day out to support that same growth in our local communities. 96% of West Virginia's employers are small business owners, and they are the backbone of our economy. While we work hard to help tens of thousands of West Virginians on unemployment find new opportunities to succeed, we can't overlook the training and skills that these people already have. And that's why tonight I'm introducing the Self-Employment Assistance Act. It's a new program to strengthen our local economies and make it easier for West Virginians receiving unemployment benefits to get the help they need to open a business. Starting a new business can be hard, no matter how great the idea may be or how hard the owner works to make it a success. With this exemption, new business owners will be able to reinvest in their company and their employees while continuing to receive unemployment benefits to support their families. For 14 years, Matt Dolan worked as a diesel mechanic at a local coal mine just outside of Charleston. When the mine closed, he lost his job. Matt knew he could earn a good income using the skills he already had, but he needed help starting his own business. Earlier this year, Matt attended a West Virginia Small Business Development Center workshop in Putnam County. He sat down with business coach Brian Shaw to develop a business plan and find a good location for his new venture. A few months ago, Matt opened D&D &D Truck Shop, a full-service diesel truck and heavy equipment repair shop. Not, not long after he opened, Matt hired his first two employees, two mechanics he had worked alongside at the coal mine. With the help of the Governor's Guaranteed Workforce Program, Matt is in the process of getting additional support to train new employees. Although D&D &D Truck Shop has only been open for a few months, Matt has seen tremendous growth and he's already looking to expand. So Matt, Casey, and Ronnie, please stand so that we may recognize you and congratulate you on the success of your new business. <laughs> Helping our residents develop the skills to find a new career is important, but keeping them off drugs is, is, critical to, to our, is critical to our state's growth. Substance abuse has become one of the greatest struggles our state has ever faced, and it is destroying the lives of far too many of our family members, friends, and neighbors. We must continue to make the fight against substance abuse a top priority. In 2011, I established my advisory council on substance abuse to help us find more localized ways to combat this epidemic. Since then, we have updated our prescription drug monitoring program, cracked down on the sale of drugs used to make meth, and put an end to doctor shopping. We have shut down pill mills for irresponsible prescription practices, and my administration is committed to continuing the fight against drug companies that oversupply pain medication without proper orders. <laughs> Last year, we invested significant state funding 
to expand critical substance abuse treatment and recovery services. In your seats tonight, you received a brochure that details 150 service providers in every region of the state. This brochure is available online at local courthouses, hospitals, schools, churches, DHHR offices, and libraries in all 50 counties. This September, we launched 844 Help 4WB, the state's first 24-hour substance abuse helpline. This call line gives people the opportunity to speak with certified professionals and receive referral support in their local communities. So far, the call line has connected more than 700 West Virginians with treatment and recovery services across the state. In October, I welcomed President Obama and DHHS Secretary Sylvia Matthews Burwell for an honest discussion about the devastating toll this epidemic is causing West Virginia families and communities. A few weeks later, I traveled to Martinsburg, what some call, consider the ground zero of our state's heroin epidemic, to host my own substance abuse summit. We brought together a panel of West Virginians to share their exper experiences in the fight against substance abuse, recognize the progress we've made, and identify ways we can work together to create a brighter, drug-free future for our residents. We want people to find help and hope in West Virginia. And that starts with making sure treatment facilities are providing comprehensive care. Tonight, I'm introducing legislation to establish licensing requirements for medication-assisted treatment facilities. Research shows us that the use of Suboxone and Methadone alone does not support long-term recovery. These medications don't treat the root cause of an addiction and only continue the addiction cycle. This legislation requires counseling and behavioral therapies to be used in conjunction with these medications to make sure they're seeking treatment, that the seek, they're seeking treatment and have the support they need to begin the recovery process. <laughs> Last year, I urged this legislature to expand access to Narcan to help our state's first responders, friends, and families of those struggling with, with addiction reverse the effects of a heroin overdose. Since May, we have coordinated training sessions in regions across the state to teach first responders and others how to administer this drug safely. Today, more than 100 people are certified to host these sessions in their local communities. In 2015, first responders administered more than 3,000 doses of Narcan, giving those struggling with an opioid addiction the opportunity to get help. When an overdose happens, every second counts. And in many cases, fire and EMS crews aren't always the first ones on the scene. This November, Patrolman Nick Castleman and Patrolman Seth Johnson found themselves first on the scene of a drug overdose on Charleston's west side. The officers, officers administered two life-saving doses of Narcan, and within minutes, the young man regained consciousness and was transported to the emergency room for treatment. Patrolman Castleman and Patrolman Johnson are here with us tonight. Gentlemen, please stand and let us say thank you for the work you do to keep our community safe. This man's life was saved because of quick action by these officers and our, and our efforts to expand access to this life-saving drug. Tonight, I once again urge this legislature to expand access to Narcan by supporting my proposal to make it available to any West Virginian without a prescription.
This new legislation requires pharmacists to become certified to train those who receive this drug to make sure they can safely administer it if a crisis occurs. It will also help us keep track of who is receiving Narcan to better focus state resources in areas hardest hit by opioid overdoses and be sure it isn't being used as a crutch to enable a heroin addiction. We know our state substance abuse epidemic is heartbreaking for many of our families and communities. But in many cases, our children suffer most. And that is why last year, following recommendations from my Commission on Juvenile Justice and with the help of this legislature, we launched comprehensive juvenile justice reform. This legislative package provided $600,000 in new funding to establish truancy diversion programs in each of our counties that offer inter early intervention to those students who need it. Since launching its own program in 2010, Putnam County has seen significant improvements in overall student attendance and achievement. <laughs> truancy referrals have dropped in half, and four-year graduation rates have increased from 78% to 90% during that same period. <laughs> but we know this program works, and it's making a difference for students like Winter Davis. For most of her life, Winter didn't have a stable place to call home. From the time she was born, her parents struggled with substance abuse. She spent much of her youth living with a family of no relation, helping to care for their young children and elderly family members. Between 2011 and 2012, Winter missed 39 days of school. She got behind in her classwork and was struggling to keep up with her classmates. With the help of Putnam County's Truancy Diversion Program, Attendance Director Jennifer Hodges and Judge Philip Stowers, Winter got the extra attention she needed and earned her high school diploma, graduating with a 3.7 GPA and zero unexcused absences. <laughs> today, today Winter is a certified EMT and plans to become a teacher for children with special needs, a dream that she's had since the sixth grade. Winter shared part of her story with me and said, life was not easy for me, but I'm making the best choices I can. I'm the only one in my family that has gone to college, and I'm going to finish college no matter what it takes. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Winter Davis, Jennifer Hodges, and Judge Stowers. <laughs> These reforms have also expanded youth reporting centers to get help, kids help in their local communities instead of sending them to group facilities away from their families. By connecting children and families with substance abuse recovery services, mental health programs, and functional family therapies, we are giving the whole family the opportunity to thrive. Thanks to the changes approved by this legislature and the work of our local partners across the state, We've reduced the number of kids being sent to out-of-state home placements by more than one-third and reduced the number of detention beds by more than 40 percent. So far, we've saved six million dollars and the Division of Juvenile Services if confident, is confident that we could double that savings in the coming years. By providing our kids with the help they need at home, we're giving them the opportunity to take advantage of the bright future that we're creating here in West Virginia. In 2010, we started down a path to improve our state's public education system. Instead of allowing paperwork to drive education, we refocused our efforts to provide our children with the skills they need to compete in today's global economy. 
Since then, we've expanded early childhood education to help our youngest students build a foundation for a lifetime of learning. We're engaging middle school and high school students with hands-on training programs. We're breaking down bureaucratic silos between state agencies, providing more seamless transition for students transferring between community and technical colleges and four-year institutions. These reforms and the standards that come with them are giving our kids the knowledge and skills they need to succeed. And that starts by making sure that our students are in the classroom for 180 days of instruction time. <clears throat> Over the past year, the delivery of public education in West Virginia has been used as a political football by members of both parties. It's disappointing, it's unacceptable, and it's a disservice to our kids. At a time when comprehensive reform... <laughs> at a time when comprehensive reform has led to real improvements, our students are more competitive with our peers in other states. We need to build on these successes, not introduce legislation that prioritizes summer vacations over a good education. We cannot allow politics or red tape to get in the way of providing our kids with a thorough and efficient education. <clears throat> Now, while there are a number of reasons why traditional charter schools are not the best option for our students, we can find common ground by rewarding schools for innovation and creativity while raising student achievement. That's why I am introducing legislation to restructure the current Innovation Zone system to establish a new program called Innovation in Education. This, ed this legislation reallocates nearly two and a half million dollars in existing education funding to help schools develop new methods to increase our students' interest in science, technology, engineering, math, and entrepreneurship. By giving schools the flexibility to focus on these subjects, we can teach our students how to think critically, a skill they need to be successful long after they've graduated high school. All of us in this chamber tonight, and those watching and listening across the state, know that we're experiencing budget challenges unseen in more than a generation. Nearly every agency and every branch of government has shared in the burden of these reductions. In spite of those challenges, we are paying not only our current bills, but keeping every financial commitment of the past, paying down our debts and workers' compensation, teachers' retirement, and public employees' retirement. And we've done that without a single tax increase while reducing tax burdens on West Virginia families and those doing business here by hundreds of millions of dollars. Tonight, I am introducing legislation <clears throat> to pay off our old workers' compensation debt more than a decade ahead of schedule. By accelerating this final payment, we can remove additional severance taxes on our coal and natural gas industries, providing much needed relief to help them invest in our state and employ West Virginia workers. While historically low energy prices are good news when we fill up at the pump and pay our utility bills, they make it hard on our state budget. Now, as we work to find new ways to ensure our tax base is both stable and more diverse, we must also cons seriously consider new revenue opportunities. Tonight, I am introducing legislation to increase our state's tobacco tax by 45 cents a pack to a total of $1. This increase will be considered too high by some and too low by others. But it strikes a balance that protects retailers in our border counties and discourages our young people from smoking while generating nearly $71.5 million annually in new revenue. Combined with savings from a new prescription drug contract, $43 million of this new revenue will fund PEIA, 
meaning public employees will not see the dramatic benefit reductions initially proposed for the coming year. <laughs> I'm also proposing, proposing legislation to eliminate, eliminate a sales tax exemption that brings our state's telecommunic, telecommunications tax in line with 41 other states across the country. Once adopted, this legislation will place the same 6% sales tax on cell phone and phone line usage, putting us in step with what is done in other, with the vast majority of other states. By eliminating this exemption, we can collect an extra $60 million each year. With <laughs> wasn't sure about that one, were you? <laughs> with, with these proposed changes, and despite low severance tax projections, the 2017 budget I present to you tonight uses no money, no money from the Rainy Day Fund. And it does not include any across the board budget cuts beyond those already in place. So. In spite of the tight budget years of the past, our new six-year budget forecast shows surpluses of nearly $7 million in 2019, $89 million in 2020, and $118 million in 2021. Now, while I won't be in office to see these surpluses, I'm proud to have been part of more than 30 years of responsible fiscal policies that have put us on the path to a brighter financial future. As we look ahead at the challenges we must overcome this year, we're reminded that West Virginians have never had it easy. We have proved time and time again for generations what has been true all, all along. The people who call our state home are among the best and the brightest in the world. Clara Grant Santucci grew up in what was once a one-room schoolhouse with her five brothers and sisters. This Doddridge County native spent her childhood, like so many West Virginia children, playing outside, caring for the family garden, and racing her brothers and sisters on their family's graveled road. By high school, she was breaking records and winning state track titles. Clara was determined to run cross country for Coach Sean Cleary at WVU, and her hard work paid off. As a Mountaineer, she became an All-American. In 2011, she ran the Boston Marathon. Clara finished 16th overall and was the third American finisher. And three years later, she made her mark on the national stage, winning the Pittsburgh Marathon with a time of two hours, 32 minutes, and 25 seconds. Last summer, Clara returned to the Pittsburgh Marathon for most, of the, for, mo for most of the second race. She sat in second place. But after catching sight of the leader, she found the mental toughness to not only win for the second year in a row, but to finish 40 seconds ahead of her comp competition. This February, Clara will travel to the U.S. Olympic Trials in Los Angeles for a chance to compete 
for Team USA in the 2016 Summer Olympics in Brazil. Now, <laughs> Now, Katherine Johnson, who was born in White Sulphur Springs in 1918, she will become what NASA Administrator Charles Bolden called one of the greatest minds ever to grace our agency or our country. For 33 years, she worked for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, what is now known as NASA. She used the most advanced practical mathematics of her day to chart and verify the math John Glenn would travel as he orbited the Earth. In 1958, Catherine's research focused on calculating margins of error for spacecraft takeoff and landings. The 34-page document was the first paper ever published by NASA's Flight Research Division with a woman's name on it. Through Throughout her career, Catherine published 26 scientific papers. Her research was used to complete the Mercury and Apollo missions and was critical to sending man into space and bringing him home safely. For decades, Catherine's story was hidden in the pages of history. This November, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Honor, Medal of Freedom, our country's highest civilian honor for her incredible contributions. In an interview with the Charleston Gazette Mail, Catherine's daughter, who's with us tonight, Joy Lick Halley, a former NASA scientist herself, said it was her mother's quiet confidence that drove her to succeed. Joy Lett told the Gazette Mail, my granddaddy told my mom she was no better than anybody else and she was no less than anybody else, and she believed it. Please join me as we celebrate the courage of these incredible West Virginians and wish Clara the best of luck at next month's Olympic trials. Ladies, please stand. Now, whether a marathon runner, an unemployed miner, a NASA scientist, a single mother going back to school, a budding entrepreneur, the CEO of an international company, or a recent graduate overcoming challenges to help her, to help her local community, West Virginians have always been willing to work twice as hard and be twice as tough to get the job done. Over the next 60 days and throughout the coming year, we know there is work to be done and difficult cho choices to make. Tonight, I challenge each of you to find the courage to make these decisions for the sake of the next generation, not the next election. It's time to get to work. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless the great state of West Virginia. Thank you.